Hi there, welcome back to the channel. Welcome to the second video in the restoration series of this Low Opta Truxo 1701W. And this is the teal one. This is the one that someone went crazy with in kindergarten and painted it. Some of you have actually commented on this and uh, you like it. Uh, personally, I don't. Everybody has their own taste. The beauty is in the eye of the beholder. My eye is not on that wavelength. So what I'm doing on this video is I want to get the uh, the basics done. The first stage is obviously the power supply. I always do that first. Next stage is try and get the uh, the audio, make sure the audio is working, the, the pre-amplifier and amplifier section working. And then, of course, follow that with getting the AM bands working. And then the final one is the FM bands working. Now, in this particular radio, because of I don't know, just asking around. I, I've mixed up some of the some of my recipes. Hopefully the, the final product will come out the same way. But I just decided to go with the flow. What I want to show you here now is the result of uh, all the capacitor swapping that uh, was required. Quite a lot of it, actually. The capacitors were in really bad shape. Fortunately, resistors were impeccably close to the rated values, some of them surprisingly so, like 0.1% in some cases. I don't know how they did it. But it's always a good thing when the resistors in a radio hold their value, because generally it tells you something about the, the series or the lot of, of resistors they used, the type they used. If one of them is bad, you usually find a lot of them that are bad. If a uh, few of them are very, very good, you usually find all of them are very, very good. So it's not a rule, but it does tend to work out that way. So if you want to see what happens with the, the AM bands and the audio and all the replacements that I'm going to do, stick around and enjoy the video. But before I carry on, I just want to thank the sponsors of the video, PCB Way. You can find them at PCBWay.com. And this is the company where I get all my PCBs for the uh, projects that I do and share on this uh, platform. You'll find a huge range of PCB types. There are also 3D printing services that I've used recently to get some uh, gears for one of the radios that I was restoring. Especially useful is the fact that you can get both uh, filament and resin prints. A very, very good quality. The prices were great as well. And one of the services that I haven't paid that much attention to, although I'm part of it, is the shared project section. And here you'll see projects that many, many uh, creators have uh, uploaded, including myself. And it's as easy as finding the project you want. Here's an example of the supply board for the DIY tube tester that I did. I've got quite a lot of projects on here. You just have to... Uh, Follow the videos that I post, and I usually put links straight to the share page. If you want to get these boards, all you do is you add to cart, and everything is there to make it easier for you to order. So whether you're looking for PCBs, for CNC machining, 3D printing, shared projects, whatever you want, go to PCBWay.com. You'll find something for your needs. As you can see, things are looking a little bit different here. I removed the dial glass because I did not want to break it. These uh, little clips on the side had been left unclipped. So the dial glass was actually just flapping around here. That's not a good thing. I then started working on the tuning condenser, which was completely stuck. And I'm glad to say that it is now moving quite freely. I don't have the pointer in yet, but I can see it move down at the bottom here. So the tuning condenser for AM seems to be sorted. I lubricated all the pulleys. So that's uh, one more step done. I then looked at this section here because I knew that at least one of these wires had been ripped out. The problem is I wasn't sure where it had come from. It wasn't obvious where it had been ripped out from. So I had to, I had to go to the schematic. Here we see the section that I'm talking about. It's all the section that has to do with the ferrite antenna. The ferrite antenna is this thing over here. So I had to look at this section to find out which of these wires had actually been ripped. I knew it was one of these, the ones that go to the actual coils on the ferrite. And I know that this is one of them and that's one of them. So one of them is for long wave, one of them is for medium wave. However, they usually or sometimes are in series. So if you break one, you're uh, disrupting both bands. And I checked everything very carefully, starting from the switches where they, um, they get selected here between FM and AM. Going back, you can start searching really from the top of one of the, from one of the uh, tuning condensers, one of the fins. And going back here, I checked everything and found that the brake was actually on here. So uh, it should have received something, but it didn't because there's all sorts of filtering down here. These LC uh, circuits here will obviously affect it. But of course, I was getting nothing. And the other thing is, because this break was here, I wasn't getting the external antenna signal from here. And because in Madeira, I get very little on, on the ferrite antenna by itself, 
I'm not surprised that I wasn't getting, getting anything there. So this was really all in place just for the ferrite without the external support. So I resolved that, fixed that up, and then I went searching and I found another break, which was on this coil over here. And the break was over here to ground. So this coil was also broken, but that wouldn't have affected things too much. The other thing is one of these caps, this was a paper capacitor, so I've replaced that and I've got all this done. And I've actually followed this through to the FM section because, as you know, I don't have FM either. And I wanted to make sure that it wasn't something to do with the, the antenna circuit. It doesn't seem to be. And then, of course, it was time to focus on the power supply. Now, this capacitor here is a dual section, 50 plus 50 microfarads. I've replaced it. I restuffed it, took this out, ripped the guts out, restuffed it. I've shown how I've done that before. I can link above, if I remember, to a video that I focused just on restuffing filter capacitors. And the fact that it was up here makes it actually quite easy to work on because uh, removing it was a breeze. So I restuffed it, two by 47 microfarads, 450 uh, volt capacitors in there, rewired it. That capacitor was there, so I just decided, decided to do it while I was here. I don't even know where that comes from. I just wanted to finish the top. And then I had to focus on the selenium rectifier. And I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do with that because on the underside, there's very little space. See, the underside is this section over here. It's that strip over there. There was a lot of stuff here that was difficult to get to. I didn't have space to put one of my usual boards on here. You know, I've got these little boards that I could simply have fitted in there, but it wasn't going to fit anywhere. So I decided to restuff the actual selenium rectifier. By the way, what you see there is that safety cap that's on the schematic right at the uh, input from the main supply. I replaced that. That was a 5 nanofarad. I replaced that with 2 by 2.2 in parallels because I didn't have a 4.7, but that should be fine. So what I did was I rebuilt the actual selenium rectifier. Same as I would do with a filter capacitor. I ripped the underside out and ripped out the guts. Now, if you haven't seen one of these, it uh, makes a bit of a mess. All these little washer thingies is what comes out of there. Now, once you've taken all that out, all you need to do is replace it with four 1N4007 diodes or something similar, rectifier diodes. And because I didn't have a board that fits in here, I used a normal, one of those little uh, experimental boards. So with the wires coming out, I try to keep the same color scheme. I've got this thing ready to put it back in. And once it gets back in, it looks like it's never left. There it is. Pretty neat. As long as you leave the wires longer than you need and then you, you trim them as you solder them in place, it should be fine. And it looks perfect. It's exactly the way it was. And now I know that this thing is good for many, many years. It's not going to stink the place out. And um, it looks original. So. Going back to schematic, I've painted all this in uh, in green, which is stuff that's been sorted out and checked. And then we get to the uh, power supply section here. Oh, by the way, that capacitor there is actually a very important one. That's the one on the top that I said I wasn't sure where that was. That is the actual AGC cap. So that's a good one to replace. And it was very convenient at the top there. So that got replaced as well. Then this is that um, 5 nanofarad safety cap. It's just to clean any RF from getting into the mains, back into the mains or coming in from the mains. So that was fitted there. Everything else is working fine. The switches, the fuse is all fine. And we get to this section here. This is the selenium rectifier that are replaced with four 1N4007 diodes. So I could now paint that in. I can paint these as being replaced. I've got the uh, this section here is working fine. This is the 6.3 volt heater supply. I know that's working because all the, the heaters are all the tubes. The heaters are lighting up. I know the dial lamps are fine, so that's all been corrected or painted in as green. And this is really where we are. It's looking, it's starting to look like, um, yeah, an artist's paint board. I like uh, starting to paint these in as I check them. And what I'm going to do now is actually power it on again, because I've done things that I think would require doing to get the reception. In other words, I've corrected the issue with that, um, with those coils at the front end there. I've uh, sorted out the power supply. I'm a little bit nervous because putting this back on the underside, the selenium rectifier back on the underside, there are some pretty tricky places to wire, to, to solder to. Oh, one other thing I did is I replaced, I cut the mains supply that was coming in that had been sort of stuck together. I cut it back or cut it down and I've wired it directly into, 
its place on the radio. So now it's nice and neat on the underside. And what I'm going to do now is just power it on. I have everything set up as usual. I've got the mini whip at the back there. I've got the speaker in place. I'm going to put the volume on max. Put this on long wave. Let's see if I've forgotten anything. I'm going to put one bulb on, only the 40 watt bulb, and I'm going to hit it now. It is, it came on and it's dimming again, so I don't have any shorts. What I want to know is if I've sorted out the, the B plus properly. If there was a short right now, the maximum current would be very low. So I'm not too worried about that. I'm just hoping we can get some joy from the reception. Oh, I'm getting some noise. Now there's one bulb, 40 watt bulb. So this is highly restricted. The radio is seeing 165 volts, it's drawing 130 milliamps. Yeah, getting something. It's receiving. I'm going to put one more light bulb on, a 60 watt bulb. There we go. So the radio is now seeing 197 volts. Let's try medium wave. Brilliant. The time controls are working. Obviously, I'm going to replace all the caps in that section anyway, but at least it's working. What about FM? Hmm. Let me take the antenna to the FM dipole inputs. Let's see if we get anything now. It's probably, the voltage is probably too restricted for FM, but we never know. I'm going to give it one more light bulb, 60 watt light bulb. Actually, I'll give them all. The radio is now seeing 216 volts, drawing 200 milliamps. No. Absolutely bugger all. Okay, but one step at a time. The AM is back and um, I haven't even started really replacing capacitors, which is a good thing. So that's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to get into the underside and start tackling all the paper caps and um, see whether we First of all, I'm sure we're going to improve reception on uh, on the AM bands and clarify things up and then see if we can't get the um, the FM back as well. It has to be done anyway, so that's my next task. Okay, folks, here we are. I've replaced all the paper capacitors and they were in really bad shape. This is the result of all the swapping out. Some of them were really bubbling at the ends there. Some of them had actually cracked. So it's a good thing I replaced this. This one here seems to have been replaced before. Anyway, let's go back to the radio. So what I do when I replace these is, um, first of all, I try to use all the same capacitors. In this particular case, this one got the yellows. Sometimes I use the black Carl capacitors. Sometimes I use the Panasonics. And you have to be very careful when you do the replacement because some of these contact points are very, very uh, sensitive or very fragile. So when you desolder, you've got to be very careful. Mr. Carlson actually shows a method whereby you, um, you heat up the joint, you push it through, you cut a little bit of the wire off. If you want, go and check how he does it. I also use that method, and that is to try and get these things out, because sometimes they are wrapped around. Now, in this particular radio, they hadn't wrapped around three, four times. They just uh, put it through, twist it, and then soldered it. So you usually can get them out quite well. And I managed to do all that, because if I can't do that, then I do the uh, little pigtail, and I connected that way. And I did that with one over here, which was a problem because the, 
the solder point had too many um, connections on there. I knew I wasn't going to find the hole, so I decided to do it that way. But otherwise, all, the, all these have been replaced and nothing too dramatic was uh, discovered other than the condition they were in. The other thing I try to do is if I move, for example, that out of the way to get to that capacitor, to get to put that capacitor in, I then bend it back to exactly where it was. This is called lead dress. And the reason is that with, uh, with these point-to-point -point, uh, wiring, with these point-to-point -point solderings, the position of the actual wires and the, uh, the components can actually have an effect on the stability of the circuit. You can get oscillations if you have these things interacting with each other. Because don't forget that any wire going parallel or in, in close proximity to another one is a capacitor. So if you've got very small capacitors here, like uh, in some cases, a few picofarads, that can very easily be replicated by having just wires running too close to each other. So that's all I can say about this. There was one electrolytic that I changed, and that's this one down here. It's the cathode, bi cathode bypass capacitor on the uh, output tube. There's one more here, which I haven't replaced yet, because that's the FM discriminator cap. I want to check all the AM first and the audio, and then I'll go on to that. Let me show you on the schematic what it is that uh, has actually been done, because I did find something interesting here. This is where we are so far. You can see quite a bit of it has been painted in. I did not do the usual, which was to follow these supply lines, the Beep 1 Plus and Beep 2 Plus all the way through. I decided to go a different route, which was, as you saw, test reception. I got reception, so I started checking areas that um, needed immediate attention, like all the capacitors. And you can see they've all been, all these that, all, that have all been changed are marked in red. Quite a few of them, as you can tell. There are still quite a lot of capacitors here that were not changed, and most of them, if not all of them, are actually either polystyrene, sorry, polyester, or ceramic, it seems. So those normally don't need replacing. I've checked one or two, not a problem. You can see up here, that's the other electrolytic that I will be changing. But what I've got so far is I've got this thing ready to test again to see if there was any difference from the, from the last time. There's one thing I found that is different. This setup here, where the audio comes out of the, the triode of the EABC80. So audio comes in here. Actually, let's just go a bit further back. You've got audio being produced across this, um, this uh, volume control. That's the volume, okay? It doesn't quite go to ground. There's a 500 ohm resistor before it gets to ground. And that is because there are feedback networks coming back from the output. You see that? There's the output, uh, the secondary of the output transformer. There's actually a lead that a connection that comes to here, and there are various switches along the path which have to do with the with the tonal characteristics that you want to produce or reproduce. So you can actually short that to ground with that, and that is U15 and 14. Where is 15 and 14? There it is. There, there, and there. So that is normally closed. If you push FM, this opens, and that results in fewer of the high frequencies being leaked to ground. So what they're doing is they're making sure that when you have FM, the sound is not dulled. When you have AM, you don't need as much of a bandwidth on the audio, so you short that to ground and it creates a different, a different tone. But you've also got other tonal switches here. The B is the bass, I think. If you go here and you look for bass, it doesn't have the B, but I would imagine that's the bass. And bass switch, S1 and S2 is the speech, S1 and 2, it's that one there. So you would have a different path for the audio tone, for the feedback from here to go back to this point. And the audio path would either go through that capacitor and that resistor, or it would just get shorted through if you wanted it to, to create a different tone. And then that audio comes to here, and it gets to another series of tone shaping capacitors here, but ultimately it gets to the bottom of that volume pot. So if you can imagine, if you've got a voltage here, a particular voltage with a particular, um, well, composition of, of, of frequencies, and you suddenly subtract that, whatever's coming back here, the result is that those frequencies, part of those frequencies are actually deducted from the portion of the, of the audio that's going to go into your preamp. And that is your preamp. Now, this is actually a dual function tube. There are the two diodes over here for the uh, FM detection. And you've got the other diode here for the AM detection. If you follow this back, you can see that it goes to the AM output of that um, IF transformer. So this section here is just the triode. And you've got the grid. Audio comes in here from the volume pot, 
through there, through that capacitor, DC blocking. This thing is biased. Yeah, it's grid leak bias. So there's a 10 mega ohm resistor to ground, which creates enough bias voltage over there through the leaking of electrons through that resistor. Because it's a very high resistor, you get very few electrons, but it does create enough voltage to bias this so it doesn't sort of run away with you. And the audio goes in there, it's amplified, comes out there. Now there you've got a little leakage to ground to get rid of oscillations, so the possibility of high frequency audio going through or signals going through. And then it comes to here. And this section is different on the radio itself. It sort of looks like nobody's messed with it. So I decided just to replace the capacitors, check the, uh, the uh, signal going through. And we know it is because we are getting audio. And just not really mess with it too much because I don't want to risk altering something that somebody altered because uh, they needed to, or the model that I'm working on could be slightly different to this one. It, it does happen. But these components are all there. They're just the way they've wired this, for example, in the case of the, I think in the case of mine, this switches off to the pot. So this part of the pot's connected directly to that capacitor there. And I really can't tell you why they did that, but all these are there. That, that uh, capacitor is the important one. That's the one that actually feeds the signal, the audio signal, to this um, grid. And you've got a 1K grid stopper and a 1 meg uh, grid leak resistor. The bias on this one is cathode bias. So you've got a 150 ohm resistor here to ground. And it's cathode bypassed so that uh, the audio frequencies do not get affected. All the audio frequencies will be amplified. And that is a 50 microfarad capacitor, which I replaced with a 47 at 50 volts. This is a 12 or 15 volts. Never mind, it's uh, more than safe. So everything seems to be okay. And I've done a few checks on resistors as well. And I've got to tell you, I was really shocked. These, these things have held out very, very well. I mean, less than 1% error on most of these resistors. It's incredible. I think it's basically pure chance, but they are very, very close to the rated values. So I'm not too worried about that. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to once again test the, uh, the AM bands because you always have to be careful. I've done various tests as I go along. I'll replace a group of capacitors and then test it. Make sure that the, uh, the signal is still coming through. And if it isn't, I know it's something I did, for example, on these three capacitors. If they're close together, I know it's something I did with these three. I can go back and check. Sometimes it's a solder blob that you might have dropped. Sometimes it's Sometimes you just wire it into a wrong connection. It's happened to me. It can happen. So you just have to be very careful. Don't do the whole lot and then go back and test it. Go and test it. But, you know, do two, three, test it, two, three, test it. It's not difficult. At least you know that you're not messing up. And the idea is to improve it, not to deteriorate it. So let's go back and see how the reception is now. All right, we're back to the mini whip connected. We've got the speaker connected. I've got all the light bulbs in place. So there's as little restriction as I can give it without actually bypassing the dim bulb tester. And I've got it on medium wave. It's really difficult to determine whether this thing's working fine with um, the tone changes. I, c I know these are. More bass, less bass. It's what I expected this time of day, so I'm not surprised. Long wave. I don't think I get anything this time of day, no. Oh, I do. And certainly here a difference, so these things are all working fine. Okay. So that seems to be working. Now, what about the FM? Let's try the FM again. See if anything miraculous happened. I'll change the antennas quickly. And see what we get. Mm. 
Not very promising, is it? Damn. I'm going to replace the ECC85, see if that has any effect. Hopefully, we'll get something. I've got a new one here. Oh, this solder tags come off. Ah, let's leave it like that. Should work without the shield as well. Try again. I know that I've got some stations down at the bottom here. Should be getting this thing loud and clear in about three or four places. I'm getting bugger all, that's not good. Oh. Hey, what is this? Well, it's giving me something. Whoa. Where did that come from? This is uh, odd. Nothing else. So what exactly am I getting up there? What frequency is this? Let me just look at the dial glass. I think this is the top end of the band, but I can easily find out. So we'll see where we are with this little signal generator. I think I'm near the top. There I am. That's 102 megahertz. Where's this going to? There's 104. Now, what is this supposed to have? This is this radio is supposed to go as high as 100. Certainly not 104. That is my 101.6 that I normally listen to, which is great, but I want to see why it doesn't get lower than that. It's sort of... That's 101.6. Okay, so it's only receiving from 101 upwards. <laughs> well, I always say that I like to extend my bands to get 101.6, but this is ridiculous. And I think it's got to do with the tube, because the other one wasn't giving me this. Let me try that again. It 
So this new tube was giving me that. Mm, still warm. That one was giving me nothing. Let's see what we get now. Nothing. What if we don't get anything down there? Let's see. No. At least I know now that the next next task is the FM. And what I'm going to have to do, you see, because I was receiving um, at the top end of the band with a new tube, this might indicate that some of the alignments are wrong or some of these coils have been shifted or moved. So I have to check all of them very carefully again. Uh, when you change an ECC85, which actually is a tube that runs pretty hot and, and it's usually it's usually one one of the ones that um, quite frequently need replacement because they work over time. And when you change that, what you're actually doing, you're, you're actually putting a little bit of a change to the um, to the actual tank circuits that surround it, both for the oscillator and for the uh, the the actual front end amplifier, because this has got two triodes in there. So you can actually affect it. And the fact is that the tubes don't all have the same capacitances between the pins depending on the manufacturer, the age, and so on. So you can actually, you may actually need to readjust the alignment, the IF alignment sometimes, and the RF alignment. But I think this is probably more simple. The fact that this thing is open means someone may have well have been tempted to bloody fiddle again. And I, I really get annoyed with that. But if that is the case, it's usually quite simple to, to do. So I'm going to do that since I know that I can get to the 101.6, which is what I want. I'm going to be extending the band to at least 102 maybe sacrificing a bit at the bottom end. Sometimes you don't need to, but that's something I'm going to tackle next time. For now, that's where I'm going to leave you. I'm really glad that we've got all the uh, capacitors replaced. Besides the fact that they are in pretty tricky places to get to, there was nothing really dramatic about it. The change in the actual schematic, the way the, the schematic is versus what's wired here, seems to not affect the audio at all. So either someone made a change and they've done it right, can't understand why they would have done it, Usually those changes are mistakes. You desolder something, put it back in the wrong place. I don't know why they've done it, but um, yeah. Otherwise, it's just a little modification on this particular um, model. It's the same as the one on the schematic, but you sometimes do find differences uh, in the wiring layouts and also in some of the component values. I've had that more times than I can than I care to remember. So this is where I'm leaving you. And I hope you've enjoyed that. The challenge with the cabinet is coming up pretty soon. I'm actually quite anxious to get started on that. It should be fun. I'm really looking forward to see what is under that blue or teal. But anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this. If you have, click like, share, subscribe, and all that jazz. And if you want to support the channel directly, please do so on Patreon and PayPal. Once again, thanks for watching. Bye for now and stay safe.